humor me. Bend your arm and squeeze your bicep muscle. Now touch that muscle with your other hand. Now relax it. And squeeze again and relax. What do you feel? Besides the rock hard bicep, obviously. But aside from that, what do you feel? Movement, right? Do you see a little mouse? Well, some anatomist did when he coined the word muscle because the movement of a muscle reminded him of a little mouse moving under a blanket. The word muscle comes from the Latin word musculus, meaning little mouse. There are animals hiding in other parts of your anatomy as well. Your cornea, the transparent membrane covering the surface of your eye, comes from the Latin word cornu, meaning animal horn because delicate though this tissue seems, it's actually surprisingly hard, like an animal's horn. I call these animal-related words animologies, and you're sitting on an animology right now. Well, at least I am. The coccyx, commonly called the tailbone, is a small triangle-shaped bone at the base of the spinal column and named for its resemblance to the beak of a particular bird. Coccyx is Greek for cuckoo bird. And if you think you're gonna have trouble remembering all of this, you're underestimating your hippocampus, the part of your brain crucial for long-term memory and named for its resemblance to the hippocampus, a mythological sea creature that was part fish and part, not hippo, horse. Hippo is Greek for horse. We also have animologies for other parts of our anatomy, including those with less scientific names like buck teeth, crow's feet, goatee, ponytail, pigtails, and spider veins, just to name a few. In fact, animologies are everywhere in our language. Many of our own names, cities, and countries are named after animals. So are cars, constellations, rivers, plants, and sports teams. There are thousands of words, idioms, metaphors, proverbs, everyday expressions, even letters of the alphabet that have animals hidden within. Reflecting how deeply connected we are to animals and how deeply rooted they are in our history, our consciousness, and our hearts. But, you knew a but was coming, but alarmingly, we have many figures of speech that reflect a disturbing amount of violence towards animals. Expressions like kill two birds with one stone, there's more than one way to skin a cat, there's no room to swing a cat, take the bull by the horns to shoot the bull, kill the fatted calf, bleed like a stuck pig, make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, to eat crow, easy as shooting fish in a barrel, the straw that broke the camel's back, and to run around like a chicken with his head cut off. We call people animals when we want to insult them most. We call someone a snake in the grass or a dirty rat, a bird brain or a filthy pig, fat pig, stupid pig, greedy pig, male chauvinist pig, or just pig, or pick any animal. And it's usually an insult, calling someone a dog or a chicken or a worm. Now, I know what you're thinking. No cow or pig or chicken or rat or any animal is hurt or offended when we use their names as insults. So what's the big deal? The animals themselves don't know the difference. And for our part, the metaphors serve as convenient and colorful linguistic shorthand that everyone immediately understands. And while it's true that the animals don't know the difference, it's also true that our choice of words reflects our individual and collective values and reveals much about who we are, what we believe, and how we behave. Our language represents and reinforces the attitudes of our culture, giving social credit to our thoughts and actions. That's why making sexist comments, even when women aren't present, is still not okay. Sexist comments, whether or not women hear them, reinforce sexist ideas and behaviors. In the same way, using disparaging language about animals, even though the animals are unaware of it, gives social legitimacy to our depiction of them as being so inferior to humans that they deserve to be subjugated and denied control over their own bodies, their own offspring, and their own lives. In fact, I would argue that the systematic violence we perpetrate daily against animals is not only reflected in our language, but driven by it. For hundreds of millennia, our human ancestors were one weak species in the struggle for survival. With weapons and will, we came to dominate all other species, even those for whom we were prey. 
As a result, any reverence we once held for their autonomy and strength devolved into chauvinism and arrogance as we characterized humans as intelligent and civilized and nonviolent and animals as simple and savage and violent. This is especially apparent when we hear about humans committing the most violent crimes. We don't say they're behaving like humans. We say they're behaving like animals. And yet, for all our self-declared supremacy, humans are wiping out entire species, destroying vital ecosystems, overpopulating the planet, and bringing billions of animals into the world each year only to kill them. This is not a legacy we should be proud of. This is a legacy whose consequences are dire for all species, including our own. And that's the point. We're all connected. We are all animals. This fact is apparent not only in our physiological features, but also in our lexicological roots. Referring to that immaterial essence that animates all living beings, the word animal comes from the Latin word anima, meaning breath or soul. The word animal comes from the word that means soul, and yet one of the ways we justify subjugating other animals is to assert that they're not like us, that they don't have a soul. This too has consequences. In denying non-human animals a soul, we're debasing our own. How? We know that in order to hurt or kill fellow human beings in war or any act of violence, first you have to dehumanize them, to create a psychological distance from them that enables you to justify hurting or killing them. And the quickest and most effective way of lowering the status of a human is to call them an animal. This is not just semantics. Using derogatory animal words to discriminate against fellow humans has enabled us to commit the worst atrocities in human history. Systematically calling people of color apes, monkeys, and baboons laid the foundation for systemic racism and slavery in our country. Systematically depicting Native Americans as hogs, dogs, and wolves laid the foundation for the near annihilation of the indigenous peoples of North America. Systematically characterizing Jews as rats, pigs, and worms, the Nazis laid the groundwork for the murder of over six million people. The Hutus, systematically depicting the Tutsis as insects and cockroaches, created the fertile ground for the Rwandan genocide. And while it makes us uncomfortable to hear these depictions of various human groups, they rest on stereotypes of animals, which are false in their own right, as if pigs are inherently disgusting, as if rats are naturally devious, as if wolves are brutal and vicious. They're not. But our perceived human superiority dictates that we perceive them as such. And yet, if we were to characterize these animals based not on our own biases, but rather on what we actually know to be true about the cognitive, emotional, and social lives of these animals, it would be an entirely different story. After all, pigs are intelligent, playful, and fastidiously clean. Rats are social and adaptable and resourceful. Cockroaches? are survivors, characteristics we admire, characteristics we all share. However much we try to differentiate ourselves from other animals, I think we know deep in our animal bones, dare I say muscles, that we're more alike than we are different and that even our small differences don't warrant our arrogance. Human and non-human animal alike, we share the fundamental aspects of eating and drinking working and playing, fighting and loving, birthing and dying, living and breathing. Some of this is expressed in positive metaphors that reveal our similarities, busy as a bee, gentle as a lamb, quiet as a mouse, strong as an ox. We call people who are the most protective mother hens. These are expressions to embrace. The idea is not to abandon animal related words and expressions altogether. The idea is to be aware of our language and to ask ourselves, does the way we talk and write reflect and reinforce our connection to and our compassion for other animals? Or does it reflect and reinforce hostility and disgust? To be clear, being mindful of the words we use is not about restricting or policing language. It's simply about making sure our words are consistent with our values. Do we value compassion or violence, connection or separation, kindness or cruelty? 
Now, I'll warn you, when you start paying attention to the words and expressions you use, you will be surprised by all the animologies, positive and negative, that you say and hear. You may even enjoy finding compassionate versions of the most violent idioms. Instead of beating a dead horse, you may find there's no use watering a dead flower. Instead of killing two birds with one stone, you may find a way to cut two carrots with one knife. Or whatever you like. There is, after all, more than one way to peel a potato. The point is, at a time in our history, when we're so fixated on what divides us rather than on what unites us, what we need is a vernacular that reflects compassion for everyone. In this compassionate paradigm, we would see animals not as subjects of ours to use, but as cohabitants, contributors, and fellow earthlings. And we would recognize that despite the high esteem with which we regard our own species, in our treatment of others and the planet we share, we might do well to take some cues from our animal brethren. By changing the way we talk about other animals, we change the way we perceive them. By changing the way we perceive them, we change the way we treat them and the way we treat each other. By changing the way we treat each other, we can create the compassionate world we all say we want. Changing the way we talk about animals may not change animals, but it might just change us, and it could just change the world.